For the last 1,500 years, Catholic theology has been shaped by the enduring influence of two intellectual giants, St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas. Now, a third figure has appeared to present the faith of the Church in the language of our own age. Explore the dynamics of the teaching of Pope John Paul II on the program Faith for Today with Father Richard Hogan. Hello, my name is Father Richard Hogan. I'm a priest of the Archdiocese of St. Paul in Minneapolis in Minnesota, and I have been working with priests for life for the last four and a half, five years with the permission of Archbishop. Priests for Life is a national pro-life organization out of Staten Island, New York, which promotes the gospel of life, particularly regarding abortion and euthanasia. But I'm here at EWTN Radio today, and I'm rather happy to be here because it's February when I'm taping this, and it's very warm here, as opposed to Minnesota in February. But I'm here at EWTN Radio to continue the series called Faith for Today. This is the third half-hour program in this continuing series. And in this program, we will begin to consider the content of Revelation. Particularly, we will consider John Paul II's approach to the mystery of God. Now, in traditional Catholic theology, there's been the treatise of on God as one, and then the second one as God as Trinity. And today, in this program, we will be considering God as one, the first topic of Revelation. And as we said in the previous two programs, John Paul II has a totally new way of presenting the faith. He has a new synthesis. He's taken the kernels of Revelation where Christ came to reveal about us and God and united them with phenomenology, which is a modern philosophical movement out of Germany uh, beginning around 1900, to produce a new synthesis of the faith. And this yields a whole new way of approaching uh, the, the teaching of, of uh, the revelation of Christ. So we begin, really, with man, and that is because we're created like God, as we said in the first two programs, and created like God in his image and likeness. We reflect him, and if we reflect him, each and every one of us in our own unique way, because each reflects God, each human being, who has lived, is living, or will live, each human being reflects a microcosm of the mystery of God. But because that mystery is infinite, therefore each of us reflect, reflects a, a small part of the inf infinite mystery of God. That's why no one or that's why no two of us are alike, because we all reflect the incredible mystery of God in our own unique ways. But because of this, we can look to ourselves to know something about God. And that's the way we begin. And the reason for beginning that way is because we know ourselves and we know our own experience. We cannot reach out and touch God directly. So one of the ways to begin reflecting upon God is to look inward to talk about ourselves. Now, <clears throat> all of us have had the experience of seeing an ocean, a mountaintop, seeing a newborn child, seeing something which has moved us some incredible beauty, some incredible experience. Looking at the Grand Canyon might be an example. There are any number of different experiences, but looking out over this event or this great scene of beauty, it could be a man-made beauty, it could be a piece of art, it could be listening to, a, to music, it could be listening to a Shakespearean play, it could be any number of things. In fact, there are about as many possible experiences as there are people on Earth or people who will live on Earth. But in any case, we've all had an experience like this where we've had time to reflect and looking out of the Grand Canyon or the ocean or seeing the play, we think to ourselves, not only are we doing this, but we know we're doing it. In other words, we have a self-awareness. The Pope talks about almost ourselves standing outside of ourselves and looking at ourselves, doing this or that, seeing this or that, hearing this or that, or experiencing the particular event or scene. This is a self-awareness. This is what he would call a consciousness. We watch ourselves doing things. And from this consciousness that we have, this self-awareness, which is unique to human beings, that is to say to persons, the angels would have it, and obviously the three persons in God have it, but the animals and the plants do not because they do not have this, this self-awareness. They don't watch themselves doing things. 
From this self-awareness, there arises certain questions. Usually, it's expressed, for example, looking at an ocean or mountain peak, the Grand Canyon. Where did this come from? How did, how did this come to be? Sometimes it can be the result of just driving across the prairie for hours and hours and hours, or the desert for hours and hours. Or I imagine it on a long ocean voyage. Or maybe it's similar to what the astronauts might have experienced on their way to the moon, or even uh, circumnavigating the globe in their capsules. Where did this come from? How could, how could this all come to be? That's one of the questions. But then, of course, there arises the further question, because of the self-awareness, not only where did this come from, this mountain peak, this ocean, these stars, this earth, but where did I come from? And that's, of course, a much more fundamental question, much more important question. It's hard enough to answer the question of inanimate creation. Where did all this, this stuff come from in this beauty? But where did I come from is a much harder question to answer. Scientists can postulate how the earth came to be, can postulate how the mountain came to be, how the ocean came to be, and so on. But when it comes to the question of the human person himself or herself, this is a much more difficult, much more probing kind of question. And of course, partially, it's answered. It's answered through a genealogical tree. You know, who was my mother? Who was my father? Who were my grandparents and great-grandparents? Which part of the world were they born in? Where did they come from? But it, that doesn't go to the heart of it, because the heart of it is this idea of, of self-awareness. Where did this ability to think about what I am doing while I'm doing it come from? Where, where did that come from? This consciousness, this self-awareness, this ability to watch myself do something. Where did that come from? And that, see, points to a power of the human person, mind and will, the power to think and the power to choose, the power to think about what I'm doing, the power to choose to do it in the first place. And so an everyday experience, an experience of beauty, leads to uh, questions about oneself as well as about where this beauty came from. And while you might be able to answer the origin of the mountain, and even the origin of the human body through genealogies, what seems very, very difficult, what seems almost impossible to answer, is where did this power of self-awareness, of self-consciousness come from? And that directly points to the existence of God. John Paul II constantly, repeatedly, in document after document, and homily after homily, refers to these questions that people have. One of his favorite examples is the rich young man who comes to Christ with questions. And these questions, while they're expressed in different ways, in different cultures, at different times, these questions most notably reflect the deepest questions about the human person possible. In other words, what is my origin? Why am I here? What is the meaning of my life? Where am I going? And so forth and so on. Even though they may have different content in a particular time, in a particular place, the questions often reveal the deepest part of ourselves and therefore reveal this, this questioning about our origins and most especially about our spiritual side. In other words, the power to think and the power to choose. John Paul II often refers to this. Of course, for most of us, we don't want to think about these questions very often because they're hard to answer. And in a particular way, they, they point to our future, which points, of course, to our death. And we tend to avoid questions that point to that because there's no way to ask some of these questions without asking the, the, the chief one that bothers a lot of us, where am I going? What will happen after my death? We don't want to think about that. But at times, they force themselves upon us. As I say, uh, at those moments when we experience great beauty, at those moments when we realize that we will end up in dust, like the prayer that the priest uses when he puts the ashes on your forehead, remember, O oh man, that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. These events eventually lead to that, especially an event like a funeral or a wedding, some significant change in one's life or in the life of a loved one will lead to these questions and ultimately to this question about our future. 
And these are fundamentally unanswerable. That's another reason why we don't want to consider them. They're unanswerable in a human in a human plane. They can only be answered by God himself. So this consciousness or self-awareness, which is a function of the mind and also clearly of the will because we allow ourselves to uh, be open to these questions, at least at certain times, lead directly to the question of God. And God, obviously, if he's going to have created us and created the world, has to have certain characteristics. This is simply a conclusion from the <clears throat> positing of his existence. At the, mo at the most basic level, God is the creator. Remember that even Thomas Jefferson, the Declaration of Independence, and Jefferson was a deist. He didn't believe in the Christian triune God. He didn't have the same kind of faith in Christ, probably, that we do. He, he believed in God, but simply as the creator who threw the world out into space and watched it develop without any personal involvement, much like a child might watch a top he throws on the tile floor and watches it spin. So God created the world and watches it develop. This was Jefferson's idea. But even he talked about God as the creator. So this is the most basic aspect, if you will, of God himself. And we know that there has to be a creator because just looking at the human person, if you answer a child's question, where did I come from? You often will say as a parent, well, you, you know, you, we are your parents and you came from us. Next question, well, where did you come from? Well, grandma and grandpa, and where did they come from? Well, grand, great grandpa and great grandma, and so on and so forth. But there has to be a beginning point, some point where there is the first parent who then gave life to a child, who then passed that life on to his or her children, and so forth and so on. And, of course, that's Adam and Eve. Well, then the next question is, well, where did Adam and Eve come from? Well, you might say they're, if you accept evolution, their bodies evolved, and so forth and so on, and then you get back to the original cell, living cell, the first amino acid. Where did that come from? And so forth and so on. Eventually you get back to the Big Bang. Well, where did that come from? And then we posit a creator God. And you could ask the question, well, where did the creator God come from? And you say, well, uh, he came from another creator God, and we say that was God Prime. Well, where did God Prime come from? Well, God Double Prime, and so on. But you can see that you go back for an infinite number of God Prime and Double Prime and Triple Prime, God Millionth Prime. Eventually, you can see there has to be an end. There has to be a God who created everything, but who himself is not created. And this has caused this is called, pardon me, the uncaused cause. It is called uh, the God as the creator who himself is not created. This is, uh, he ha has no cause outside of himself. Now this has profound implications and it's very, very important. You have to posit this because you cannot continue to go back. At some point there has to be someone who creates everything from himself but who himself is not created. Uh, this is the first argument for the existence of God in St. Thomas's famous five ways. And this hasn't changed for centuries. But it holds, it's logical, it's absolutely ne necessary to have a being who was not created, but who um, creates everything else. So the, God, first of all, the creator, is the uncaused cause. He causes everything else but he himself is not caused. And the Lord revealed this to Moses when he said, I am who I am. Remember, Moses asked the Lord, asked Yahweh, what's your name? I have to go back to the Israelites and tell them somebody sent me. What's your name? Who am I supposed to tell them sent me? And the answer came back, I am who I am. In other words, I am the one who is. There never was a time I did not exist there never was a time when I will be a time when I don't exist. I am existence. I am being. I am to be. My essence, the definition of who I am, is to be, to exist. God is his own, his own being. Otherwise, he couldn't be the uncaused cause. Another way of saying this, explaining this, this mystery, and it is a mystery, because we have no experience of this. 
we're not the cause of our own being. If we were the cause of our own being, if we were, by definition, existence, then there would, never would have been a time where we didn't exist. No, God isn't that. Or excuse me, we are not that. Rather, God is. In other words, God is being himself. To be God is to exist. To be God is to exist. God means existence. Therefore, to say God does not exist is a contradiction in terms because God is existence. So to say God does not exist, you're saying existence does not exist, which is a contradiction in terms. His essence, the very essence of God, is to exist. So the definition of God is simply existence. And this is essential because otherwise he wouldn't be the uncaused cause, the origin of the universe, the creator, the one who always is, who creates everything, but who himself is not created. So he is being itself, existence itself. Now, I know many of you have not thought of things this way, and this is a bit abstract, but this whole teaching on God as the uncaused cause is very important because from it flow many of the other characteristics of God that we traditionally attribute to him. And not only traditionally attribute to him, but th these attributes he has. So it's important to see how this all develops. Now, since God simply is, he is being. Think of it as a huge ocean, and that ocean is existence. Anything that exists compared to a drop of water. So, for example, let's say God is beautiful, which he is. And that's one drop of water, but God is existence or being. Well, that drop of water gets dropped into that ocean, it disappears. So every attribute, every perfection of God, everything that God is, is a totally identified with his being. You know, we might be, for example, intelligent, or we might be skilled at carpentry, or we might be uh, good at math or whatever. These are attributes or characteristics or talents. They exist. They're not totally identified with who we are, because there probably was a time when we weren't so good at math or we weren't so good at carpenter or whatever it might be. But with God, since, since he is being or existence, there can't be anything that exists in him separate from existence. Existence is like this ocean. God is like this ocean. And that ocean is to be or existence. Every attribute that exists or has being is part of that ocean. So every perfection, every attribute, everything God is, is totally identified with, with his essence or being. And, and in this way, God is perfectly simple. There aren't any parts to God. Now, we'll talk about the Trinity in the next program, but it's important to remember there are, there are no parts at all. Now, this God created. He created the world. And in creating the world, he shared existence or being. He made stuff. And out of there's nothing that's made that was not created through him. But in sharing being with the world, giving it existence, since he is being or existence, he shared himself. In other words, there was nothing. God created. God created by giving existence to things. And since he is existence, he shared himself. And when you share himself or share yourself, that's love. And so God loves. So we have these that God is the uncaused cause. He causes everything else, but himself is not caused. There isn't a God double prime or triple prime and so on. And everything that he is is totally identified with his, with his very core of his being because he is existence, and all these attributes and perfections would exist, but they don't exist separate from, from existence, which is himself. And once he created the world, he shared existence or being, and that was sharing himself because that's what he is. So as Pope Paul VI says that these two names of God, being and love, ineffably express the very divine reality of him who wished to make himself known to us and who, inhabiting inaccessible light, is in himself above every name and above all things and above every created intelligence. Now clearly, in creating the world out of nothing, can you imagine the stupendous act of power? I mean, we began this program by talking about the great, great beauty of nature, and we also refer to some of the great feats of man, bridges and dams and, and huge skyscrapers and so forth. 
and they express incredible power when you think about it. But can you imagine doing that out of nothing? And that's what God did when he created the world. So therefore, uh, there's incredible power here. This is one of the characteristics and attributes of God. So we've talked about four of them so far. The uncaused cause, that he's perfectly simple because everything that he is is identified with his existence. We've talked about how he loves because he shared existence or being when he created the world. And we talked about power, this, this incredible act of stupendous strength in creating everything out of nothing. Now, we also talk about God as being perfect. And, of course, he has to be. He has to have all possible perfections because he created the world. So everything in the world came from him. So every perfection in the world obviously has its origin in him because he created it. There's an old phrase in Latin that you can't give what you don't have. Nemo dot quod non habit. Obviously, God, in creating the world, gave the world everything that it is and therefore gave it every perfection, not only every perfection that exists, but every possible perfection of every creature, of every single created being. Those perfections must exist in God. Not only that, all the possibilities of other types of life, of other types of worlds that God could have created have to exist in him. And also we can argue to the same thing, this, the fullness of perfection in God, because if he were to lack something that could exist, he would not be the fullness of being. In other words, because he is the uncaused cause, he has to be being itself. If he is being itself, he has to have everything that is. And that means that he has to have the fullness of being, including every possible perfection. Otherwise, he will not be what he said he was. I am who I am to Moses. Now, another a attribute of God, which is sometimes upsetting to people, is that God cannot change. Now, remember, we're talking about the divine nature. When we, when we discuss God as one, of course, we're talking about the oneness of the divine nature. We're not talking about the incarnate second person of the Blessed Trinity. We're not talking about Christ in his human nature. We're talking about Christ, obviously, but only in his divine nature. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the divinity now, in the one nature of God, cannot change. Why? Because change usually is the result of an outside force. For example, I'm sad, I'm depressed, and all of a sudden somebody decides to throw me a party, say it's my, my birthday, and I'm depressed because it's my 40th or, or something like that. And my mood changes. Why? Because of the stimulus of the friends who are throwing the birthday party. The change in me is caused from the outside, but God is the uncaused cause. He cannot be changed or affected by someone from the outside or by anything from the outside because he is by definition the uncaused cause. Nothing works on him. Nothing causes him to do anything. Therefore, he cannot change from, from an exterior stimulus. And he doesn't change from within, as we sometimes do, because with us, we want to change sometimes so that we become better. For example, we might decide if we smoke to give up smoking. That's an imperfection, at least if the smoker decides to give it up, he sees it or she sees it as an imperfection. And so this imperfection it should be improved. And improved means eliminating the imperfection. And so you become better by changing. Well, God is, is all perfection. He's perfection itself. There's nothing that he lacks. There's, there's no imperfection in him. Otherwise, he would not be the fullness of being. So he cannot change by somebody working from the outside or some event working from the outside to influence him. He doesn't change from within because there's no necessity since he's perfect as he is in himself. So he's changeless. He's changeless. He's also spiritual and immaterial. That is to say, he doesn't have a body. Now remember now again, we're talking about the divine nature. We are not talking about the second person of the Blessed Trinity who became man in his human nature. We'll talk about that later in another show. What we're talking about today is the one divine nature to which the second person, along with the first and the, and the third, are united. 
And clearly, uh, he cannot have a body in the divine nature, otherwise he would not be incorruptible, that is to say, unchangeable. The body corrupts, the body changes, the body grows and then decays as we grow older. People say we start decaying the moment we're born, and that's a kind of negative way to think about it, but nevertheless, we we do change and because we have a body. Not only because of that, but certainly that's that's a big part of the changes we notice. If God can't change, he obviously cannot have a body, and he couldn't... Um, couldn't have a body and be changeless. Furthermore, he wouldn't have all perfections because the material things are by their nature um, imperfect. In other words, it's it, it, you can't have in in a, in a pure absolute sense um, a perfect material thing. So because God is changeless and, and perfect, he does not have a body, at least in the divine nature. Also, because God is changeless and Time is is the measure of change. Think about it. The month is the cycle of the moon. The um, the year is the Earth orbiting around the sun. We measure changes by time. If God is changeless, there is no time for him. And so in a certain sense, he stands outside of time. He's eternity itself, meaning that all of history, all of creation, everything is on one movie screen. He sees everything all at once. In this sense, God is totally changeless. Well, our time is just about up, and so we will conclude here. We need to talk about at the beginning of the next program a couple more of the characteristics of God, and then we will go on to God as Trinity. Remember, I'm Father Richard Hogan with Priests for Life. Thank you very much for listening to this third installment of Faith for Today on EWTN Radio. Join us again next time for Faith for Today with Father Richard Hogan here on EWTN Global Catholic Radio.